Welcome back to DBS and the DFL studio with Honourable Dr. Penny Anthony. Tonight we'll learn more about our Prime Minister other than his political career. And you will have an opportunity to ask questions, whether you want to call or whether you, could, you want to send via the usual ways. But first, I want to have a blank page sure. of our Prime Minister, if you don't mind. My and I want to tonight. I want you to feel free to ask me anything. Thank you very much. Yeah. Because a lot of the time, people assume they know about you, and so I think yeah. it'd be nice for us to kind of you tell us the facts about you. So, for example, when were you born? I was born on January eighth, nineteen fifty-one. So I'm actually sixty-one at this time. I was born in a very tiny community called River Dory. River Dory is about three to four miles before Swazel. That is, if you're going towards Sufra. Um, I'm an Anglican, by the way. A lot of people don't know my religion, but um, I'm an Anglican. From Rivadori, I went to live at uh, Park Estate for a while, close to Solibus, and then, of course, returned to live in the Rivadori community. But I had an unusual childhood in that when I was about uh, six years old, I was sent to um, live at the rectory in Rivadori with a father, Smart, to look after the church. The Rivadori Church, Anglican Church at the time, they called it the Grace Church Rivadori. I spent a couple of years there, and my job was basically to ring the bell, say service, and say service with Father so when you Sorry, but when you said you were, you were sent there, why were you sent to live there? Well, basically, I think um, Father Smart felt that there was some need for a person to um, look after the basic routine in the church, like ring the bells. Um, at the appointed hours. I became an uh, acolyte on the day that I was confirmed, so I also um, helped you in service at the church. Um, after Rivadori, and this is the, the de point of departure, just when I turned about eight, um, I went to live in St. Vincent with a uh, Vincentian family called the Jokins. It was thought at that time that it would be a good opportunity for me to learn face-to-face -face the English language, be have a better command of English. Because you know Vincentians don't speak Creole like we do. Mm -hmm. So I was shipped across St. Vincent and it was a, an extraordinary experience in my life. Extraordinary because there have been moments in my life when I've made pilgrimages to St. Vincent just to reconnect with the experience I went through. I lived with a family in a village called Barley. Barley was about 12 miles away from Kingston. So every morning I had to get up at 7 to catch the bus to go to school in Kingstown. And then, of course, in the afternoon, there were no buses after three, o after three o'clock. So we had to walk 12 miles from Kingstown to St. Vincent nearly every afternoon. Sometimes you got to ride, but that was very rare. Most times we had to walk most of the way. So from St. Vincent, in just about 1962, um, I returned to St. Lucia. And on my return, I went to the Labrie Boys School, did my primary completed my primary education at the Labrie Boys School. Mm -hmm. So there are times I refer to myself as being a child of, of Labrie. Mm -hmm. um, and of course from Labrie, I was one of the fortunate ones who got into the Viewfort um, Secondary Comprehensive School at Larry Schuss. Um, I was part of the first batch of students that went to that school. That's why I'm so emotionally attached to that school, mm -hmm. because it is really that school that shaped my secondary education. Mm -hmm. So the early years have been very exciting. I've had very diverse um, experiences, and I think that has helped to shape me over the years. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask this question because it, it yeah. just feels that I need to ask it at this sure. point, although we're jumping ahead. Please. Are you an emotional man? Because you seem, in the way that you are reciting, you are, to me, it appears as if there aren't, some of the memories there aren't mm. the fondest of memories, although some of them perhaps helped you to be the person that you are today. Um, I feel anguish and pain like everybody else. Um, I think most people who know me will see a very calm exterior sometimes, very calm, um, sometimes even a little reserved, a little distant. I think maybe that's why sometimes I'm, I'm an enigma to some people. But like everybody else inside, I, I do feel a lot of pain. I do feel a lot of anguish. I also um, feel the joy and the laughter that everybody else feels. Um, inevitably, in a job like this, like the one I have now, it's always a reflective job. It calls for a lot of deep thought, deep thinking. Um, you need to think all the time. But of course, it's so very important that you enjoy what you're doing. If you get bored with what you're doing, then you're going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. But you're dealing with people's lives. 
you are dealing with shaping their lives, making a difference with their lives, and it's never an easy environment. So inevitably, you have to feel their pain, mm -hmm. their anguish. You have to feel for people, especially in the field of them in, mm -hmm. in, in politics. And if you can't feel for people, you have no business to be in politics. So would I be correct in saying that what happened to you in childhood shaped you so that some of the things that you experience that you don't want to experience again, it pushed absolutely, you? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, perhaps let me share with you um, who I am in, in, in a clearer sense. Mm -hmm. First, I'm not the child of slave owners, as is often said in the um, political folklore in this country. My four parents came in, um, they were English, they came from Sussex in England, and they arrived in Sepulcher in the 1880s, in the 1890s. My father was a manager of a very big estate which belonged to the then family. And um, my mother hails from, from Saldabas. She comes from a very poor family in Saldabas. So that there, there are, in fact, two poles in my family. My mother's family, who are basically very, very poor, but extraordinary people, wonderful, loving people, who shaped so much of my early life because I live with my aunts, etc. And to this day, we are exceedingly close, exceedingly close. And then, of course, on my father's side, we really never knew my father's family because uh, my grandfather who incidentally was the first person who brought a vehicle into St. Lucia and he wow. was an engineer who designed two of the island's major bridges. One of course was the Swazel Bridge very early on and then the one that there is all the folklore about Point George in Swazel. Mm -hmm. That's where they say that he made a deal with the devil to build a bridge and the and the deal was... In the As your family? Yes, my family, <laughs> my grandfather actually. Now, a lot of people don't know that side. Okay. But my grandfather left St. Lucia somewhere in the 1950s, and we never really met him. Um, just saw pictures of him, so we, we grew up on the estate with my father and my mother. Now, perhaps I should clarify another aspect of my life very quickly. I came from a home of ten brothers. My father had four children, first of all, with one lady. He had five children with my mother. And then he had one um, late in life with another lady. So there have been 10 of us, 10 boys. Um, the first nine grew up together. My mother brought up, she's still alive, by the way. She's 94 now. Wow. Um, she's alive, she's diabetic. So I have to be very careful myself about mm -hmm. diabetes because mm -hmm. it's inherited. Um, so far, so good, but we, I still have to be very careful because of her condition. Um, and she brought everybody up, and, and it really, really was a very close family. But you could imagine with a family of 10 boys, the kinds of things we did. It was exciting, mm -hmm. um, but uh, naturally, the, uh, the, there were a lot of adventures. But of course... Were you a cheeky a child? Time. No, not cheeky. It's tough in a family of, um, of nine to be cheeky. But I knew I had my own identity, there was my own purpose in life, my own objective in life. And to a very large extent, the fact that I went to St. Vincent and, and had a different experience, had a different kind of exposure, I had a passion for education, I had a passion for doing well. It, it, it began very early in my life that I knew that the key to my future was getting a different kind of education. Mm. So, but I wasn't really very, very cheeky, I was adventurous for sure. And I did all the things that boys did. Some of it I regret, I regret today. And um, there are moments in my life now when I look, look back, um, you may think that I romanticize it, but when I look back, perhaps even myself was too harsh on the judgments that I made because it was, it was so extraordinary, the things we did. I mean, I, I made fish and guns like everybody else who go and fish for um, crayfish, the big crayfish. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the rivers, um, made fishing guns to go to the sea. Then, like every all young boys, I caught birds. I mean, and I really regret this now because at my home we encourage as many birds as possible. Mm -hmm. So whether it was a catapult mm -hmm. or the satwap or a very dangerous and lethal, um, very 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 lethal um, trap called a plia, just lethal because once a dove went on it and mm -hmm. touched a stick, it was just and yeah. just fly up and catch it. Now, I did all of those things. I had cages with, with birds. Um, I was never really good with a catapult. Never really good. I mean, mm -hmm. I had a little brother who was superb. So we did all these things. We spent a lot of time in the river. We caused my mother deep anguish. Um, for example, um, where we lived, um, there was a beach 
called Astululu, very close to River Dory. Mm -hmm. And there used to be those, those giant trunks, huge trees. Um, and I remember one day in particular that we decided um, to build a raft to go out to sea. <laughs> and we decided to cut the gourmet trees and um, to tie them together. Of course, my father got wind of this and mm. he put an immediate stop to it. But we decided we were going to be seafarers and mm. led by my elder brother who now lives in Canada. Mm. Just, I think, my mother and father intervened just in time to, to save the bench and probably um, what might have happened to us down the road. So all of these things that I did. Mm. Um, I learned to swim in a river as a country boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite recently, I was sharing with a friend exactly where I learned to swim. I go and visit the site sometimes. I get overwhelmed with nostalgia, especially, mm. for example, when things are tough politically and I just want to be alone, mm. and I, I just want to, to um, manage my emotions and, and relate to the environment I know best. I'll go down and yeah. to the f spots that I grew up as a child and walk around. And That's and a comfort and factor. It is a comfort yeah. factor. Yeah. You get an extraordinary attachment to, to the environment that made you and that, that shaped you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I don't want to romanticize it yeah. um, in a sense because I grew up on an estate um, maybe that was where people think the privilege came, but of course the estate never really quite belonged to my father. Yes. It, it, it belonged to my father's family. But it, it's, it's not something that is known. Yes. But I grew up like, as we would say in Korea, um, whatever I have on the moon, mm -hmm. um, playing um, cricket with um, coconut. Uh, I heard Stop. that. I heard that was your favorite yeah. sport. But we're going to talk a bit sure, about sure. more more about sure. some of the favorite things of the prime minister and some of the other things that perhaps, as he said earlier, that he regretted, um, and some of the wonderful sure, things sure. in his life too. Sure. So stay with DBS until all facts alive. We'll be right back.